tools that have emerged that allow us to deal with the VUCA world that we live in, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And when I say new, I mean, everyone, I, I, people often object when I use that word, but I mean new in the sense that the, the, the synthesis, the language is new, or in something like lean, uh, it's just being resurfaced yet again and finally getting the attention it deserves. But uh, all of these things, their roots go way back, but the attention to them or the language around them, they're, they're being surfaced at the moment as tools that allow us to deal with a complex world, starting with complex systems theory. Simple systems are systems that we understand. Simple systems are systems where we can model them. We can write an equation or draw a model where the inputs have a relationship to the outputs. We can show that for a certain input, there is an output. And this machine here is the machine that prints my books. So this is the paper goes in one end and your digital request for a book comes in and it creates one book, binds it, shoves it in a mailing bag, slaps your address on it and fires it out to the postal system. So it starts with paper at one end and posted books at the other, amazing. But it's, it, so it's an extraordinarily complicated machine, but it's a simple system. Inputs create outputs. Uh, whereas uh, uh, the, the world we live in is VUCA, is a complex world. And these models used to work because the rate of change of the world was so slow that it looked like a linear world. It looked like a stable world. It looked like a world it was a world where simple models were a good approximation of reality or a sufficient approximation of reality. And that's no longer true. The world is now changing so fast and change is now the permanent condition that these simple models don't work anymore. And this exhibits itself in one of the biggest problems we have in IT, but it's also a huge problem all across organization and work is this myth that we're dealing with a simple system. And when we think we're dealing with a simple system when we're not, we have this ridiculous approach to work where we, defi we define once and ex expect people to execute perfectly. And so this is the problem with waterfall. This is the problem with conventional projects is that we will gather the requirements, we'll do a single design and then we'll go and build it and then we'll measure whether we built it well. And that's fine in a stable world, but project management can be described, this kind of waterfall project management can be described as building last year's requirements, right? It, 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 it's too slow and too unresponsive, so the results are out of date before we get there. Whereas in, in, a, in a complex system, the attributes of a complex system are that they can never be fully described. We can never fully capture what's going on in the system. A really good phrase I love is that, uh, a system is not the sum of its parts, it's the product of their interactions. And so in any real world situation, that product is so, the permutations and the activities are so amazingly complicated that we can never aggregate them and understand them. And the, the second fun bit is that some of those components are irrational agents. They're humans or groups of humans. And so inputs don't relate to outputs. You cannot describe them with a model. They're irrational, they're unpredictable. There's a random element in the system is another way of putting it. There's a randomizer between the input and the output. There's chaos theory, it's chaotic. So the body of knowledge under this is deeper and deeper and deeper that we're not gonna get into. But you can never fully describe them. You cannot predict the future state. I like to joke, it doesn't matter how much you pay someone, they can't predict the future state of your system for you. So all these highly paid consultants and the big consulting firms who are quite happy to tell you what your target operating model looks like in two years time. It's bullshit. They're just making it up. They're pulling it out of the first available orifice and they know they will never be held accountable in two years time for the fact that they just made it up. You cannot predict the future state of a system, period. You cannot predict the future state of a system. You can't repeat results, same input, different output. Just depends on the day and the weather and the mood and right. So you cannot repeat results and they're not repeatable. You can't predict emergent behaviors. This is a huge one. Is everyone familiar with emergent behaviors? 
So um, I learned recently, I used to use the Tacoma Narrows Bridge as an example of emergent behavior. It's that bridge that shook itself to pieces in the wind when the wind just hit the right frequency. That is in fact an example of a simple system with negative feedback. It just constantly, so that's not an example of, of uh, an emergent behavior in a complex system. Um, so I'm gonna stop using that example. But uh, the, 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 the behavior of any organic being is emergent properties. My mood, is an emergent property of this insanely complex system. My mood is not the result of any one cell in my body. My mood is an emergent property of me as a complex system. And so these, you have these emergent properties that are a property of the system as a whole, but they're not a property of any one or any group of components within the system. You can't attribute them to anything other than the system as a whole. And you can't predict what they'll be. You can't explain all phenomena. You know, to this day, we're going, why the hell did it do that? We, we will never know why. Spouses are a good example. Of um, a joke there. Uh, complex systems are adaptive. They respond to their environment. So nothing changed in the complex system, but something changed outside it. It will change its behavior in response to that. It will adapt to the environment that it's in. So these are the attributes of a complex system. And if, if this isn't familiar stuff to you, then um, a, couple, a really good thing to read is How Complex Systems Fail by Richard Cook. Dr. Google will give it to you. It's in the public domain. It's just five pages. And if you want something meatier, another really good read is The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error um, by Sidney Decker, which is about human systems in particular and safety and that's been powerfully influential. Both of these people have been powerfully influential on the DevOps community in IT. There's plenty of other, uh, another great read for, um, for complex systems that I should, uh, that John Seddon has, who from Vanguard in consulting in the UK has written some fabulous stuff around complex systems from an IT point of view. So. Uh, so complex systems, get familiar with this stuff if you're not already familiar. And so also have you come across Kinethin? Again, I think everybody operating in this space should understand Kinethin um, from Cognitive Edge, from uh, Dave Snowden, good Welshman. Um, and Kinethin is a Welsh word, sort of home or the half. And uh, uh, so... Again, I'll rattle through it, but the Kinefin model says for every situation, it's a way of sense making, which is a word that we should all be aware of in the new world. Um, that, uh, you know, in, in these worlds where they're uncertain and ambiguous, we, we try and sense make. And uh, so it's situational sense making, and it says that everything we encounter is either simple. Uh, or, and there's like different, simple keeps changing its name. Simple, obvious, it's now called clear, by the way, for those who want to try. So a clear, complicated, complex, chaotic, we'll start with C, but I stick with simple. And um, uh, so it's either simple, which is a simple system we just talked about, or it's complicated, uh, or it's, um, so simple is known, complicated is knowable, complex is unknown, and chaotic is unknowable or we're in disorder in the middle. So there are five states. We're in disorder where we've got no idea which one of them we're in. And so uh, this is a very powerful model that we can use. Another model that's very powerful that I think less of you will be familiar with is case management. So case management is a body of knowledge, a body of thinking that is, you know, like legal cases, medical cases, police cases, social work cases, that idea of a case, abstracted out of all those industries, just to think about managing cases in the intellectual uh, vein, then case management. And so across all of those ideas of cases, we have these principles around how we do case management. And case management says at a certain point in time, when you're trying to deal with this case, all you know is your current state. You, the future is unknowable and you only have a certain limited, imperfect set of information. You know as much as you know. You, so you understand the current state of what you understand and what's going on. And based on that, you can come up with a set of options, a set of 
potential actions you could take and understand something about the kind of state that you're trying to get to with each of those actions. And then you need to make a decision. You need to say, we're going to act in order to, and then we'll see what kind of state we end up with when we act. And we have a broad goal up there in the top right that we think we're aiming towards. So for example, police get called, oh, we just found a dead body in a flat and they go, right, we have to secure the site. We have to get the coroner down there, and remove the dead body, let's go clean up. And so they, that's the first state action is get the coroner and remove the body. When they arrive at the flat, they've now moved, they've taken an action, they've gone to the flat. When they're in the flat, they now discover that not only is there a body, but there's blood everywhere and they've been stabbed. So suddenly we've gone from clean up the site, remove the body to solve a murder. But only when we got to that new state, did we get the new information that changed our understanding. And so that then allows us to then again, act on what we might do to get to another state and so on. And so with case management, and when we arrive at a particular state, like discovering the body has been murdered, the new information might actually completely change the goal. So we might be moving towards a completely different goal now. Now, at the point that you started on that journey, there's no way that you knew what sequence of steps you were going to go through. And there's no way that you knew what ultimate goal you would reach. And there's no way that you knew how long it was going to take. So if you combine the Kinefin thinking about you know, the situations that we're in and you say things are simple or they're a case. So there's other three quadrants of Kinefin. They're all cases, complicated, complex, chaotic. They're all cases. We don't know at the start what the end is. Only in the simple situation where it's defined and repeated, we know what we're gonna do and what it's gonna end and how long it's gonna take. Now you think about IT and you think about instant management and service desks and problem solving and you say we've got an SLA that says that we have to solve these things within two days that's just bullshit the only things that you can know that you're going to solve within two days are simple situations every time it's a case you have no idea how long it's going to take what's wrong with you people that there are all these incidents still open after three months what are you doing wrong we're not doing anything wrong they're complex cases we still haven't solved them some of them are cold cases we will never solve them IT is really bad and ITIL is really, really bad at trying to treat the whole world like it's simple, like the whole world can be made defined and repeatable. We can come up with a pattern for how to do everything. That's bullshit. In fact, the majority of the world, that will never be true. If you can get over 50% of your world defined and repeatable, you're doing a fabulous job. And even within IT, where things are highly tractable and controlled, because of technology, if you can get over 50% of your world into simple, you're doing really well. Most of your world is always going to be like this. When you start, you don't know the end. This is a really profound shift in thinking that I hope you're all familiar with, but um, it's really important. And so somebody wrote a book called Standard Plus Case a number of years ago, which is... Um, uh, is another one of my books and I think it's my best one to be honest and my most neglected one that talks about this about how we apply this thinking to the world is either standard or it's a case and this diagram is in fact from the book so that's an important concept in the complex world is to understand Kinefin and situational analysis and Stanford's case. Here's a great quote, quote from Seth Godin. If you come across him, he's one of the gurus of the marketing world. And, um, and this is this imperfection again, and embracing imperfection, understanding that it's VUCA, understanding it's almost never simple. And, and management, senior management especially, they're in this state, aren't they? Constantly, they want certainty, they want quick answers, they want a guarantee. You know, I was, had a fabulous conversation once where a huge release was about to go live in IT and some of the senior business stakeholders said, can you guarantee us that this is gonna work? And the project manager had the intellect and the courage that she said to them, no, I can't guarantee that. 
and all hell broke loose. What's wrong with you people that you can't guarantee this is going to work? So this is the new world, and this is where we've got to smash management and governance thinking all the way up to the top to understand that this is the world. This is the world we live in. It's not the IT world we live in. It's the world we live in. And conventional management is stuck in the simple paradigm. So, and 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 chaos. That fourth quadrant in Kinefin has this negative uh, uh, perception to it. But look at the life, look at the world we're in at the moment, right? With, with um, COVID-19 smashing the world and, and climate crisis smashing the world and Trump smashing the world. And, you know, this is a, we are in an era of chaos. We're moving into a deeper, the next 12 months, we're going to move deep into the chaos quadrant. And as I said, I'm quite optimistic in the medium term, but, but what comes out of chaos? can be shaped and can usually be something good. And so um, I love the saying, never let a perfectly good crisis go to waste, right? When a crisis comes along, that's a time of change. And what we've done preparatory in the past that we can draw out to underpin that is, is how we can respond in time of crisis and how we can use it to the best benefit. And in fact, people, you know, th there are methodologies and there are thinking where you just de de deliberately create chaos, right, in order to create change. It's not always something that just happens randomly. So complexity, complex systems theory. And it's interesting, someone said to me, you know, we didn't deeming know all this stuff, you know, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And I was, and absolutely he did. He understood this stuff intuitively, but he didn't have the language. Complex systems theory didn't exist until chaos theory in the 1990s. The language, the mathematics, the, 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 the intellectual tools to think about complex systems have only existed for a few decades. When I went to university, they didn't actually, there were decades before they existed. This language didn't exist. It's very much a new tool of thinking. Kinefin is totally breaking the way we think about things. It's taking us to a whole new... Deeming had none of this. He understood it intuitively, but he had no language and no tools to articulate. Network thinking as well. So understanding when we, again, we just, this is part of the simple system thing, you know, is the thinking that we have linear flow. That every, life is like a factory. You know, the work comes in and it flows through the factory and it flows out. And you've got to be really careful when you apply things like lean and theory of constraints that they are quite locked into linear thinking and the world's not like that. We can improve by thinking about braided rivers like we have in New Zealand, that, that we have quite complicated flow that is constantly changing and there are many different paths and da 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 da. But we're still thinking about the idea that it starts up in the mountains and it ends up in the ocean, that it still has some directionality to it. And in fact, that again is just an approximation. And they're both useful approximations that work in certain contexts. The linear approximation works in a tightly controlled factory with a production line. The, the braided river analogy works in somewhere like IT trying to get work out the door where it is generally still, you know, from development to production, it's still generally directional. But in the real world, the actual reality is that water flows in all directions, that it's more like, you know, a, a lake or a, or a delta or somewhere where the directionality of the water is very hard to discern if there is one. And so um, you get principles like co-creation, the idea that, and this is emerging in ITIL 4, by the way, for the IT geeks, that um, in co-creation, there's as much, well, no, not as much, there is value flowing from the supplier to the customer and from the customer back to the supplier. The customer is working with the supplier to create value. The customer gives us value back as we give them value. And so directionality starts to get really muddy when you start trying to understand your value. And you're not talking about a value stream or a value chain anymore. You're talking about a value network where it's flowing in all directions. Value is going everywhere. And so network ways of thinking are emergent ways of thinking about work. And um, 
Niels, I have I have my times with Niels. We get have some pretty stern debates, but Niels Flagging has this lovely model, which is to say that there are multiple networks in your organization. There are multiple structures that underlie your organization. And the formal hierarchical structure is only the most visible. There's, um, there are three primary networks going on within your organization. There's the formal hierarchical structure. There's the informal structure of influence around the relationships between people. And then there is the value creation structure, which is the movement of value within the organization. And again, we don't have time to go into this, but this will be a new model for many of you. And um, I recommend, he, he's got a whole lot of stuff online and some good books and, and recommend having a look at, at Neil's stuff. Just, just don't buy the Kool-Aid that you can fix an organization in three months. But other than that, um, it, 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 it's good stuff. And, and so, there are these there are these multiple networks going on within an organization there are these multiple structures that are influencing what's happening and um and 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 so this fallacy that we can just look at a formal hierarchical structure and start changing that and fix the system is just insane And then there's the rise of, of finally, of, of, of human, humaneness, of humanistics, of understanding people and emotion and, and treating people like people and sort of what John was talking about before. And the roots of this are, well, I mean, all the way back through humanity. But as soon as scientific management rose up at the start of the 20th century, just as soon there was a movement to try and restore humanity to, to management as well. So, um, uh, have, have most of you come across Lalu's book on trans, uh, reinventing organ, re organizations? Uh, that's a pretty much a standard read for new ways of working, I think. It's the Kool Aid, but it's a very readable book. Um, uh, so, he did Reinventing Organizations, which will come up on the slide in just a minute. But the other book that I, I think is the best introductory book of all is Brave New, Brave New Work by um, Aaron Dignan, which has only just come out. And, and I read it um, late last year, so this year somewhere. Fabulous book, absolutely fabulous. Introductory book to new ways of work. Uh, so anyway, Lelu took the model from integral theory and spiral dynamics and sort of changed it slightly. But basically he talks about the levels of culture in either a society or an organization. And at the lowest level, you've got gray or black, or depending on what model you're using, which is, is highly reactive, primitive caveman stuff. And then you've got cultures within organizations or society that are based on magic, on superstition, on trying to make a synthesis of the world without any real understanding of how the world works. And there's probably a few organizations that still there's certainly a lot of HR and organizations that I describe as voodoo. <laughs> it's no basis in fact whatsoever. And then there are uh, impulsive cultures that are driven by power, fear, division, right? And so street gangs um, uh, and, and a few of the most autocratic organized, uh, countries in the world and some of the most dysfunctional power-based organizations in the world are red. And then um, Amber is uh, power-based, but it's it's the sort of more positive form of that, which is driven by hierarchy, st stability. So think of um, ancient Chinese culture, which was all about the bureaucracy. Um, maybe Singapore, uh, but it's around um, bureaucratic hierarchy and bureaucratic control rather than violence control. And then uh, we move to uh, red culture, which is, um, so the USA, uh, it's driven by competition, accountability, innovation, profit, go, go, the money, the money, right? And then we move to um, green culture, which is pluralistic and New Zealand, <laughs> uh, 
the culture which is around values and balance and community and collaboration and we're all in this together and then ultimately the is well not ultimately the highest culture that we've seen exhibited anywhere in the world so far according to Lalu, is teal and the model keeps going beyond this into blue and violet but humanity is not there yet it's hypothetical and so the word teal has entered the language a bit in the agilista world as um as the highest cultural level we can aspire to where it's about the wholeness of people and um a higher purpose for the organization that we are seeking some sort of ethically driven vision for what we're trying to achieve and so medicine sans frontier maybe right uh and so we've adopted that as part of our iconography and 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 for the for teal unicorn obviously and so there's the book reinventing organizations by lalu it's a good read it, it's an introductory book to the field so this is a model i guess that when you want to think about deeper things this is but it's about understanding people and culture and humanity as a way of understanding the situation another key fundamental that i talk about and sorry i am rattling but another key fundamental that i talk about is what's colloquially known as the the lizard brain so in this simplistic model of the mind it's now entirely out of fashion in neuroscientists but it's a nice simplistic model to think of the brain is that you've got your uh primate brain which is your higher cerebral functions is the thing that allows us to do what we're doing now and then you have your mammal brain which i share with my dog which is quite complex in understanding social structures and mapping space and complex memories and emotions and stuff um, to, to understand and explore the space and then you've got your lizard brain which you share with all moving things which is about you know fight flight safety sex food hot cold survival you know and we have to remind ourselves that we are not just cerebral machines we're animals we we are lizards you and i we're lizards right and we interact at a lizard level just as much as we're interacting now at a conscious cerebral level and pandering to that catering to that lizard brain is essential when we design work and when we design management we have to understand that if people are in fight or flight mode they cannot be productive if people are working through fear they cannot be productive if you've got a psychopathic boss you cannot be productive you're in constant fight or flight people have to feel safe they have to feel nurtured in order to be productive it's 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 crude economics it, there's nothing about being nice to people it, that's how you optimize your output and and so i'm passionate about the fact that virtual will never replace the real this is never going to be as good as us being in a room together because you can't smell me really you're not getting my pheromones you're not getting all the micro movements you're, you're not seeing what my pupils are doing right so that ability to talk to get right up front get up out of your bloody chair and go and ask them right those sort of things are, are fundamental to understanding how we work uh, and again as lizards we are we will bond much higher level once we eat food together or maybe drink beer but once we actually there's something deeply psychological about sitting down over a curry that transforms our relationship understanding those sort of dynamics are essential to the management of people and this gets neglected in a lot of scientific management which is frankly psychopathic so i guess so people need these things right they need these deep lizard brain emotional things pretty good photo huh that that is my lovely wife dr vu and our dog astro in the southern alps on our way up to our place that we're not going to get to for a while now in in the alps um people need the sense of physical place where they belong right? and so hot desking and sterile work environments smash that destroy it right it's lots of hr policy is psychopathic um they need the sense of tribe you know they're belonging to a group they need within the tribe a smaller squad that they're part of militaries have understood this for millennia there's a lot we can learn from military models 
Um, they need emotional connection with people around them, not just intellectual connection. And, and this feeling of safety and security, a sense of control. Right? When people feel they have no control over their lives, they completely disengage. In fact, they get into really dysfunctional behaviors. And this is, you can see this in so many large organizations that are red or, or amber in their culture. You can see that people have just completely retreated into their burrow because they have no sense of control over their life. Well, so well, these, Rob, um, how, how do, you, do you link this at all to um, Kahneman and Kahneman's uh, systems one and two, where you've got the more instinctive, reactionary, kind of atavistic things based on limited uh, and quick kind of uh, quick retrieval kind of uh, models and system system two, sorry, system one that was, and system no. two, which is a more deliberative, you know, conscious effort to engage with something. Yeah, thinking fast and slow, Kahneman. That's one, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't I didn't know if there's any reconciliation between because I, I like I said we've we've uh, friends and I we, yeah we talk about that lizard brain where you have that gut kind of reaction and right. often you know can be it, it does it does brain. relate completely so your fast thinking is coming actually I think from the mammal or combination of lizard and mammal right so the lizard is fight or flight what do we do you know panic the mammal brain is you know when you play tennis you don't think about how you're hitting the ball right because you that that thing that you've learned when you learn something to the point where you don't think about it anymore it's going down into your mammal brain it's now part of your learned behaviors in your mammal brain and you no longer need to use your cerebral brain to do that processing and so the thinking fast mode is is the stuff that's going on in your mammal brain it's the the, the it's not automatic but it's internalized processing in your brain that you don't have to think about in order to come up with a response and it's very fast it's really really fast and instinctive models can so if you think back to kinefin and simple complicated complex chaotic when you're in chaotic you don't have time for anything except fast thinking so the model in kinefin when you're in chaotic is first act and then see what you get the first thing you do is act and so in order to know how to act, you use your thinking fast, your instinctive, your mammal brain. But your instincts are full of all these cognitive biases. And cognitive bias is another thing to study up on and could almost have a slide on. Because um, there are these all these cognitive biases that influence your fast thinking. And that's what Kahneman's book is about. And how these cognitive biases distort your thinking fast. There are times when you have to think slow and consciously suppress all your cognitive biases to reach a logical, rational decision. And so when we have the time, and when, so when we're in complex and chaotic, a complex and complicated, where a system, where a situation is novel and unfamiliar, it's actually important that we don't do thinking fast, that we stop and do thinking slow, because if we do thinking fast, our biases will influence what we can do. If we've got the time to think about something that's novel and new, we should be applying slow thinking. And then when we get around to simple, we're back to fast thinking again, because we know how to do this. Go idea, bang, bang, bang. Defined, repeatable, away we go. Thank you. That's a good one that I don't have a slide on. It's fast and slow. That's all I'm gonna say about it. I mean, I could go for days and days on that stuff. It's, it's profound and it's important. Agile is another one of the cognitive tools that we that we have to deal with this VUCA world that we're in. And and so I bet if I said, what is Agile? Everyone on this call would be like, what do you mean? We all know what Agile is. So the, the interesting thing though, is that um, Agile and DevOps uh, have no definition, right? Agile at least has the manifesto, which is something. DevOps doesn't even have that. But Agile is not really defined. I mean, I can define any, you know, agile anywhere I want so I'm going to and so um, for me the, the key thing with um, the field's a bit weird on this uh, the key thing for me is that agile is this cyclic approach to build something observe what you got learn from it and then take your learnings and build something more so it's this constant iterative cycle it's breaking work down into an iterative cycle where we create increments of product learning with each increment and so our mantra for defining agile is iterate increment experiment explore these are the four main attributes of agile 
I think. And so you have a hypothesis, you build it, you observe, you learn, and there are four possible things that you do when you learn. You either say, right, let's build some more, or we could release this thing that we've built and, um, and get people using it and increase our observational capability and our feedback, and then keep going. Or we could say, who the hell came up with this misbegotten idea and kill it, in which case we're probably gonna iterate right back to the start and come up with a new hypothesis. Um, or we pivot, which is another word that has entered the buzzword that's entered the lexicon to say our hypothesis is wrong. We need to modify our hypothesis. Uh, and then there's something left out of that cycle, which is that after we learn, just to simplify the previous picture, after we learn, the other thing we should always do is reflect and improve. And so agile has built into it when anything really is agile is that we constantly stop to reflect and improve what we're doing. So that's agile, it's right, increment, experiment, explore, and reflect and improve. And there's that quote again, agile is about speed to adapt, not velocity. So agility is not about, or agile even, the, the IT agile thing, is not about being faster. Agile is not about faster work. Agile is about being faster to change how we work. By being fast at work, by going around this cycle quickly, that allows us many opportunities to reflect and improve. By working fast, that gives us many opportunities to reflect and improve. But that's not the end goal, to be fast. The end goal is to reflect and improve quickly. That's the goal of Agile, is to be fast to adapt, not velocity. Another great quote around Agile is, um, Agile is not about being fast, it's about doing less. So, um, Agile is a tool to think about these things, and Agile is wrapped in design thinking these days, um, which is another cognitive tool emerging to help us think about these things, that within that machine of Agile, preceding that, is, is the stages to um, uh, design ideas. But design thinking is another body of knowledge to dig into to understand this whole machine of agile working. So another seminal book in this space is Age of Agile. Has anyone read Age of Agile? Steve Denning. That came out. <coughs> so one of the fascinating things about agile is that it has escaped IT. It started in IT, but it's now in the business. And Cherry and I founded the Business Agility Meetup here in Wellington, and um, Cherry founded Business Agility Meetup in Vietnam based on the Business Agility Institute, which is a global institute thinking about agility at the business level. And if you want to start rattling people at the highest level of the organization, point them to Harvard Business Review and Forbes and um, Sloan Management Review from MIT. I mean, these are pillars of conventional management society, and all three of those sources talk about almost nothing but agility these days. This stuff has gone main, main, mainstream, and the leading journalist in Forbes.com talking about this stuff is Steve Denning. So he's pioneered a lot of the business thinking at the highest levels of the public domain of journalism um, and getting it out there to governors and executive managers, these ideas of Agile. So The Age of Agile is a pretty good book. I, um, I think Brave New Work is a far better book. This one's been around a bit longer, but it, it basically summarizes what he's been saying in his articles. And, and the first half of the book particularly is really good. And, and so he talks about agility at a business level, right? And he talks about how it's not just the unicorns that are doing this stuff, working in agile ways, but it's more and more mainstream organizations that you would not expect to be talking about crazy hippie stuff, but they're talking about and doing, walking the walk of, of business agility. All right, so if you haven't read Team of Teams, there's yet another buddy book to read, Stan, Stan McChrystal, um, Joint Special Operations Command in Iraq and how they, how they 
we used team of teams models to, to win. Win. <laughs> New core steel, you know, uh, Barclays Bank. Barclays Bank is older than the United States of America, and they're one of the leading thinkers in agility. It's, it's, and Spark here in New Zealand. But, you know, these, these organizations, Spark is our major telco. These are conventional organizations doing amazing stuff. So um, when we talk about, and that's a small a, Agile, it's just capitalized at the start of the sentence. When we talk about Agile management, we're talking about people and systems, and we're talking about all these groovy, hippie concepts. It can sound really hippie, you know, um, and the problem is that there is a lot of new age bullshit out there. So people, um, the, the genuine ideas of value about these hippie-ish things can get lost in all the bullshit that's slopping around on places like LinkedIn or, you know, and it's easy to, to just get dismissed as, as more nonsense because um, there's just so much nonsense about quantum thinking and what's his name? Um, Deepak Chopra, you know, and just bollocks absolute bollocks and, and almost I put Simon Sinek, he's in the gray zone, I think, in there. Um, it's easy to get lost in this stuff. So, uh, uh, you know, you've really got to get management to understand that there's hippie bullshit and then there's hippie value. You know, and, and trying to get them to understand the distinction. Another key thought with Agile is, is that Agile is a way, not a state. Um, agile is, is, a, is a, a way, not a state, right? So it's an endless journey and, and DevOps as well. You, so you can't implement Agile. You can't have a six month project to be Agile. The moment that language comes out of an executive's mouth, you know they've lost it. Because Agile is a way of improving how you work. When do you stop improving how you work? You don't stop improving how you work. Agile is a philosophy for how you approach life and work forever. Right. So um, Manjit asked me, how do you differentiate capital A Agile from small a Agile? And that's a good question. So capital A Agile is the thing that IT invented that has a manifesto and, you know, four value principles, four value statements and 12 principles and is a methodology for thinking about work within IT. But the language, as I said, has escaped into business. And Denning, when he wrote The Age of Agile, he's, he talks a lot about IT as the origin of these ideas. But what business people talk about when they say agile or agility is much more than what's in the Agile Manifesto. And so we talk about human systems agility, right, that we saw briefly yesterday, human systems agility, as an aggregate of all these principles that when people talk about being agile, small a agile, about business agility, they're really talking about all of that. They're talking about all of the complex systems theory and the Kinefin and the humanistics and the and 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 lean and and lots and lots of stuff that is not encapsulated within the capital A agile manifesto. So that's why we're very careful to discern between capital A agile and small a agility and agile. So Agile is not a project. You can't spend a million dollars and be Agile. Go and buy me one of them Agiles. And this comes back to what I was saying before about people at the highest levels who don't understand this stuff enter this domain thinking Agile is just one more tool on the tool belt, along with Lean Six Sigma. That's not. It's a new way of thinking. It's how we approach the organization forever. That's a big transformation. The final tool to talk about is open. And this will be less familiar to many of you. But people say to me, Agile is 20 years old in IT. It's not 20 years old in business, but it's 20 years old in IT. What comes after Agile? And I don't know, because I can't see the future anywhere else. But I think it's open. I think the next word that will get diluted and bastardized and thrown around and come to mean a thousand different things 
is open. I think that's a high contender for what comes next. Now, the open movement has existed since the early 90s with um, open space and the work of Harrison Owen, who um, he wrote a book called Spirit, which is in the public domain. It's downloadable off the internet and it's hippie shit, right? It's really out there stuff. It, but it's fascinating and and um, Cherry and I have had the privilege of talking to Harrison Owen and he's 80 something years old now and he's still the most amazing guy fascinating guy nothing to do with IT and anyway he created the open space technology it's called technology in the sense of an idea that you can use for practical purposes and open space is a methodology for bringing a large group of people together to, to collaborate on evolving or originating ideas. And, and so the best example is, and Harrison Owen tells the story himself, was that when Microsoft tried to launch Azure, they got their best technologists together and they spent a year arguing with each other and didn't, I'm compressing the story, spent a year arguing with each other and getting nowhere in terms of defining what Azure was as a cloud. And they brought Harrison Owen in and he ran an open space for their technologists, two or three open spaces, I think. And um, afterwards, the project manager came up to him, the program manager for the whole of Azure, and says, we've just lost a year. You've just saved us from losing another year. We're off. I, and I've run open spaces myself. They're the most incredible lizard brain level activity for collaboration within a community. I'm not going to say any more or much about it, but that's the origins of open thinking. And, and so open, again, you've got capital O open, which is open space, and you've got small o open, which is the idea of opening up an organization, right? Of transparency and, um, and, and um, collaboration and openness to the future and opening the soul, you can go right down. So, and some of the things that are playing in this space, promise theory is nothing to do with the open movement, but it has come in and swept and been embraced by it. If you haven't seen promise theory, that's another big indicator of the future. Mark Burgess, we, we, we know Mark as well. Uh, he's a really interesting guy who came from IT, he came up with this model that's being used in subatomic physics and all over the place, which is promise theory. Uh, beta culture is, uh, came out of a lady whose name I always forget, Dana, something in the US. But this is the idea that you've got alpha culture, which is alpha male, lalu colored red, or uh, power and machismo driven management, which probably characterizes most conventional management. And beta culture, which is more stereotypically feminine around um, uh, collaboration and, and empathy and humanistics and openness, transparency. And to all of these ideas, right, they all contribute to this idea of open, openness, of self-organizing organizations, organizations that are emergent from chaos, invitational, so inviting, uh, inviting leadership is a book by Dan Mezik. And Dan is one of the leading thinkers in the open community and Dan's the guy who trained us in open space, uh, Jerry and I, and um, he wrote this really good book called Dividing Leadership and before that he wrote another amazing book called The Culture Game. Uh, but invitational leadership is, is this idea that like I talked about yesterday, you can't make knowledge workers do anything. You can't make them do anything, you can only invite them, you can only I was going to say make them want to you know you can only encourage them to want to do stuff you can only create an environment in which they're invited to work they have to opt in uh the other thing about openness is transparency of data and being very empirical and exploring the reality not exploring the bullshit that's in the minds of senior management and so lots of transparency and honesty about what's real lots of models for interaction protocols for ways and this goes back to the promise theory is one model of interaction protocols that humans interact in, in very 
complex ways, but we can create simple rules to help frame that and then let all the behaviors be emergent. So we keep the interaction rules as simple as possible and see what emerges. One of the areas that science is, scientists are studying really closely, you probably know, is the behavior of bees and ants to try and understand how such complex uh, communities can emerge from the very simple rules that drive an ant. And we still don't completely understand it, but people are unpacking how can you have an ant colony as a single organism that is made up of these very simple agents with very simple rules. Once we crack that, then using those rules will give us massively scalable structures for humans to work in very small teams, which is a key part of Agile, right? How do you have thousands of small teams collaborate to do work? Well, once we crack the ant problem, we'll have even better paradigms for how the simple rules we can use to allow that to scale massively. At the moment, it's a little bit kludgy, I think, until we get there. And then protocols around explicit agreement. How do you get humans to come to a clear agreement of what we decided to do when we'll never ever agree in the sense of have the same idea about it? So we have to, there are protocols and models around how do we get to something we can work with. I like consent rather than consensus. You'll never get consensus, but you can get consent where everybody says, all right, I may not agree, but I can live with that. I'll go with that. And, and so there are protocols and models around how do we get at least to consent that everybody's willing to move forward and at least try this new idea. And again, they don't have to stick with it. We don't have to do it because we don't know the future. We just iterate, increment, experiment, explore. So yeah, all right, I'll be part of the experiment. You're all wrong, but you yeah, all come along. Oh God, it does work. So explicit agreement protocols. And underpinning it all or originating it all is the open space technology, which is again, I'll go and learn. I don't have time, but um, it's an amazing dynamic to just get a room full of people and, and give them a simple structural set of rules for how they're going to work and then watch the emergent behaviors and see the emergent value that can come out of a single day or a two day exercise. It's just extraordinary. The value that pours out of these people 20, 40, 60, 100, 200, 1,000 people, huge groups of people, and, and giving them a simple set of rules to interact with and create their own value. Very, very powerful way of moving a big group of people forward. Well tested, well used, all over the world, one of the world's best kept secrets. And then another aspect of it is the Open Leadership Network, which Dan Mezek is one of the leaders of, leaders, doesn't have leaders, one of the primary drivers of. And so these ideas exist within that community and, um, and, and many different models, pretty much each ego within that community has their own model. Follow the good, no, follow the sandal, you know, <laughs> there's a bit of that, but there are many, many interesting models within that community. I should actually add on there, thriveability is another one that's missing, which is you want to go hippie. Um, Michelle Holloway and thriveability is way up there about, you know, it's, it's sort of Gaia theory for, for communities and understanding how we're part of the Gaia, we're part of the broad, the, the system is actually the planet. You know, the system is the planet and we have to work to be to thrive within the planet, not just thrive within an, an economy. So this is a, an amazing group of people is my point. And they are one of, one of the hubs of this thing that I think is very much uh, the future. But there is one more thing I want to talk about, which is new paradigms around how we think about change. So if you reflect, again, we won't have time to really reflect, but if you think about uh, what kind of transformations has your organization tried? And if I get a big room of people to call them out, they all come out in this list, right? These things that organizations have tried, uh, it's broken, we'll do this and that'll make it better. And, and you've been there, 
nods. You know, you've all been in the world where this is the new management thing. This is what we're going to do, and it's just going to fix everything. And so you think about these questions, how resistant were people to these things? And the more of these that have been done to them, the more resistant they get. So the success of future change is dependent not on what changes succeeded in the past, but how they were done to people. The success of future change depends on how past change was done to people, not what the outcomes were. And so how resistant were the people um, was it longer and harder than management expected it to be? Has it ever not been longer and harder than executive management or the, ex the highly paid external consultant said it was going to be? Right? Did it go right? Did it get the desired results? Even in cases where I see case studies about how it did go right and how the great results were, there's two things at play there. One is, Mr. CEO, that project that you spent $10 million on, how successful was it? Right? Oh, Highly skewed, right? So one is that bias around, I just committed the organization to this major transformation and I just poured all this money into it and you're asking me whether it worked or not. That's the first thing. And the second thing is a very short termist view of that. Oh yeah, they're all working in the new way. Well, sure they are because everyone's still observing them. Will they still be working in the new way in a year's time or in two years time? Are they really working in the new way or are they doing the little dance for the boss until he goes away? So even when they're described as successful, I'm deeply skeptical about a lot of these transformations about whether they really were and whether they'll stick. So are we good at advancing our organizations? I think in general, no. If you work for an organization that's really good at advancing your organization, I think you're lucky. They exist, the unicorns exist, but uh, uh, in general, are we good at it? No, we suck. This is all part of that paradigm around transformation as an event, as a project, as a defined start and end, as a as is leading to a to be, as a future target state. You know, do the work, get to the target state. Now we're in a new stability. This old thinking that the world's stable, then we do a change, then it's stable. This is all embedded in how we approach transformation of organisations conventionally, and therefore it sucks and it fails because it's just founded on intellectual fallacies. So, so our challenge is that transformation efforts, they don't often work, um, absolutely. And the, the stick, the construct it, and, and either it doesn't work at all or it works but it dies to death and a year or two later, it's all stopped and quite possibly wound back. It's really interesting to see how good the immune system within the organization is at winding it all back again over the period of subsequent years. Am I right? So um, we're doing it wrong. And, and you've got this slide, so I won't speak to all of it, but these are the dysfunctions. These are the things that, that um, are the, the, the fallacies and the dysfunctions that cause it to fail. The, we can deploy software in seconds. We can deploy a new process in months. And so management think that we can change the behaviors and beliefs and attitudes and culture of humans within months. You can't. Changing the culture of an organization takes years, decades. You have to wait for people to die. That's one of my jokes. The perfect example of this is Boeing. We'll get to that in a minute. So, um, and, and, and the other thing I alluded to yesterday is they're broken. What's wrong with them? Can you go and fix it? The failure to change management and governance. We're going to keep managing and governing the way we always have, but we want to see the work change and the culture change. Well, I think you're not going to see it. So um, one of the things we've got to kill is the big bang, right? Is this idea that, that we can just plan, design, do, in order to change the culture, in order to change the organization, in order to change the ways we work. It just doesn't work. And especially the, the Big Bang reorg. Let's all just have a reorg and that'll fix everything. It totally conflicts with all the things we've been talking about, right? The antithesis of what we've been talking about. Iterate, increment, experiment, explore. 
the organizations that say we're going to have a project to go agile you know they don't get agile there's nothing agile about going agile in a project but yeah this big bang thing we've got to kill it we've got to stop this idea that we can change the way we work in a big bang and particularly don't do restructures they're just toxic absolutely toxic and for those who even are still with the organization after the reorg they just bust everything so we've got to kill the restructure fast and there are so many consultants out there who start with restructures it distresses me Davi Olivier who's the CIO was the CIO of Westpac New Zealand is now the chief technology officer for Westpac um, he, he said to me you don't push reorg you pull it so it's that invitational thing when the team say we want a different structure that's when we think about what is the different structure and we should do it incrementally okay so which bit of the structure will we change you should never ever ever need to have a big bang restructure again your structure is evolving constantly it's an organic thing because we're agile another fundamental to change is continuous improvement and this is foundational to everything it should be foundational to the culture of every organization but these are continual improvement tools continuous improvement tools and there are many different models and ways of thinking about it improvement carter i think is probably the best one and i've got a slide on that um, either today or tomorrow um, but this fundamental to how we approach change is to do it incrementally to be agile we have to do it iteratively and unrelated to that the flip side of that a different way of saying exactly the same thing is to be a learning organization continual improvement learning organization same thing different views of exactly the same idea because if you once you learn you have to act on it in an initiative way you can't iterate without input on what should be improved they're the different aspects of the same thing if you don't know what anti-fragile is just google jez humble's blog post about anti-fragile that's what changed me um, it's a very hard concept to understand it's a huge transformational concept change in thinking um, and it's one that we don't really touch on because i'm only thinking about new ways of management here rather than new ways of working but it's a huge concept that i'd love to have included uh, so these are all part of you know learning culture is a foundational thing in, to change um so we run experiment programs as as a foundation to all of this stuff where we we encourage and teams to uh to conduct experiments within their teams as a foundational as a ground laying thing to get them to do initial steps forward to understand and believe that these things can work So the improvement carter i was going to talk about it but you can go and read it up for yourself uh the toyota attribute it with as being their primary tool for advancing the thinking for thinking about everything it's their situational tool everything that happens in the organization where do we want to be where are we now what's a target state that's achievable in the near term and how do we iterate our way towards that sounds really simple but it's a carter k-a-t-a uh martial arts term meaning the thing that you do over and over again till you don't need to think about it anymore a carter is get it from your thinking slow to your thinking fast get it from your primate cerebral brain to your mammalian brain internalize it it becomes instinct it becomes your gut way of dealing with the world and so that improvement carter is a specific carter that toyota use to drill into people to say this is how you intellectual in instinctively respond to everything that happens is with this response pattern very powerful tool and there's a whole body of knowledge you can go on three-day carter training courses and you can become carter certified there's a carter institute you know mike rother and um, mike lander in austria it's related to that so using a similar illustration but a, another key principle that comes up and has come up time to time in our conversations is you're working incrementally you're learning and experimenting and exploring moving forward so just be happy if you're winning don't measure yourself against perfect because if you measure yourself against what you think is your aspirational vision you will always be disappointed 
because humans are imperfect. We will always do it wrong. We will always do it less than perfect. We always fall short of the aspiration. It's just guaranteed. So if you measure yourself against perfect, you will be sad. You will not get any closer to the star, no matter how long you sail the yacht, right? Even though you're heading towards it. If you measure yourself for how far have we come, that hopefully, hopefully, is a much happier conversation. But I think that's an important profound principle. So you, most of you being of IT background, you understand what a, a conventional project looks like. We have a big project, we do all the work, we go live, we, we hand all the code over to app support, all the documentation and the code, and, and what we've built gets put into production for us, and then sausage rolls for everyone and the project disappears and, and all, the con all the contractors disperse out of the organization and all the internal staff go and work somewhere else. And the poor old app support people are left to try and deal with the, the maintaining the thing going forward. This is your classic conventional project approach to work. And it's dysfunctional. So in an agile world, we have a standing team who work iteratively building something until we reach a point where we all agree that that's something we could go live with. But then the team continues, you know, if you're really agile, not water scrum fall or agile fail or, you know, if you're really agile, the team continues to exist for the life of the product. If you're not doing that, it's not real. And the team continues to exist and continues to build because when we go live, that's just MVP. That's just minimum viable product. And we continue to build. The size of that get, the size of the team might grow and small, but the team exists for the period. And so we have a product team, not a project team. This is one of the fundamental shifts. And there are whole books about, there's hash no projects from IC Agile, from um, my, my friend Shane Hasty and, and Evan Laybourne. And, uh, even founded the Business Agility Institute. And there's a, another really good one, um, Product Not Project by Mick Kirsten, who founded um, Task something, Software Product. So there are really good books about this that I'll put the, the links out about. So this is again, and see you John, thanks. This is, this is a fundamental shift in, in how we think from events for change, projects that you know stable event stable that's what drives project thinking to continuous change continuous learning continuous improvement standing product teams so no projects so it doesn't mean no projects but it means projects no longer drive the world i'll send you some links on this so that means you don't bring the team to the work you bring the work to the team so this is another profound shift. You don't bring the team to the work. You don't assemble a team, do the work, disassemble the team. You have a team, you bring the work to the team. You put the work in their hopper, they grind the work, they do the work. So standing teams. Now they're still very fluid, they coalesce to work, people move around, but the team as an entity has a certain stability to it over time. And so therefore, this is my model, this is a Rob model, a project is a wave in your team structure. A project is a surge of work. It still exists, but it is the administrative function that administers the surge of work through your teams. And I'll send you a link to this. So project management to doing the stuff that project management always did, even when I was a young man. They managed the timeline, the budget, and the effort. And they monitor what we would nowadays call the burn down and disentangling the capex and opex which is actually more complicated now we don't have projects as a structure and mapping the benefits realization that's what a project manager should do not be god and hire and fire and own a whole floor of the building that these are the the tools we have the intellectual tools we have to um deal with the new world that we're in and now we're finally ready to talk about new ways management